So I'm now with Professor Ken Benoit, who's a Professor of Political Science Research Methodology at the London School of Economics. Now, Ken has been working with very large volumes of qualitative data, larger volumes than you could readily read, and yet he's interested in the same kinds of things as qualitative researchers who normally work with very small volumes. He's interested in meanings and processes and themes. He's working with political speeches, policy, policy analysis documents, um, discourse, if you like, about political issues um, in the media. So I'm going to try to get him to explain to us how he feels he's doing this honourably, despite this very large volume of work. And I know that he's using the program, programming language R. So somehow he's customised this. And I'm hoping he's going to explain what exactly he's doing. OK. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by honourably, but um, I can explain a little bit about the techniques that I apply to text and, and what their purposes are. So just to give you an example from work that I'm doing at the moment and work that I've been doing over the last few months, I'm involved in an EU project to look at discourse over European politics and the engagement between citizens and elites and citizen understanding and elite understanding and how these things mesh in countries, in different countries. My part of the, pro um, of the project is to analyze social media. We're looking at the social media platform Twitter and the tweets that people send. We did a project in the autumn that involved looking at all of the tweets that were sent by all the candidates for the European Parliament elections of 2014. All the tweets that mentioned a candidate that were to the candidate or that were from the candidate. And this was uh, several million tweets. The more interesting thing is that it took place in, I think, about 18 different languages. And it took place across Europe. We were interested in what people were saying. We were interested in the sentiment that people were expressing especially um, the sentiment about the European Union and whether they were expressing pro-European attitudes or anti-European attitudes. With that amount of text, clearly you need tools that can sift through it and extract things like sentiment, themes, patterns. One of the things that we did was to look at the volume of tweets in each country and compared the prevalence of certain mentions of uh, political candidates and political parties. There was a leader's debate for the first time in European parliamentary elections. They used what's called a le list leading candidate structure. Each of the three major, each of the three largest uh, European party groups that are in the European Parliament had named a head of their list. It, it was a bit like having, uh, you don't have a government, so you don't have a prime ministerial candidate, but because there was, there has traditionally been no leading person on these lists, I think the public found it harder to engage with European party groups. So this time they used uh, list leading candidates and they had a televised debate um, about two weeks before the election. And we could see that the volume of sentiment um, was, sorry, the volume of tweets was highest during that debate and also there was a spike in pro-European sentiment. Right, interesting. I mean, you're, when you're working with tweets, when I said honorably, I guess I meant without doing violence to the data and without taking things out of their context. I guess one of the rules of qualitative research is that you understand the context that that uh, data has come from and that you're not somehow misrepresenting the data. But with tweets, because they're so short, there isn't really a context. Um, but some of your work is actually with much longer material like political speeches or um, l longer statements. Yes. So there maybe context is an issue. And so I wonder how you feel about this question about taking things out of the context. 
texts are always taken out of context because the file that you have in front of you on a piece of paper or a computer is necessarily taken from a natural event in which it occurred. So you're always losing some context. It's, a, it's an interesting term to talk about doing violence to the text. Um, it almost seems like a loaded question. Sort yes, of like no, the, I am. I'm dramatizing. Yes. There's a question, uh, have you ever felt sorry about cheating on your spouse? Ah. I'm not sure that it's a good answer to that one. Um, but I don't think that um, I don't think that these techniques do violence to the text any more than you would say that um, using Google Maps to navigate Scotland is doing violence to the beautiful landscape of Scotland or the rich diversity of people in Scotland. Uh, it's serving a purpose, and that purpose is to get you from one point to another. And necessarily, you've reduced the resolution of what is represented. If you didn't reduce the size of that map to something that would fit on the screen of your smartphone, then uh, it would be pretty difficult to, to use it in your car. Yes, no, I, that, thank you. So just to finish then, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what R is actually doing when you're doing this work. Would that be possible? Sure. So the, the R is a statistical environment that's entirely open source and it evolved from an open language developed by Bell Labs in the 70s called S. And it's been around now, R has been around for about 20, 25 years. It, it's a statistical programming language and it's the predominant language used by statisticians and people who are doing social science statistical programming. Not as frequently used by economists, but everyone else seems to use it. It has some capabilities for doing natural language processing that a lot of people who for a long time doing natural language processing were using languages like Python. For natural language pro processing you need to be able to take uh, text and tokenize them to extract their words, maybe to tag the parts of speech of words, to be able to figure out frequencies of words, to do things like um, extract the roots or the lemmas of the words, maybe to exclude certain words that you wouldn't be interested in, typically stop words, things like conjunctions, articles, prepositions. We don't think those are necessarily interesting, but they sometimes are. And for a long time there were very simple tools to do this in R, but no one had really sustained a, a focus to, um, to develop this with the level of usability and quality that would make it, I think, more widespread. And there's also performance issues, because when you're dealing with very large volumes of text, for example, computer scientists uh, would prefer tools that um, typically have given more performance. So the idea with developing a package around text analysis in R was to bring the ability to do powerful but also accessible text analysis to the types of social scientists who are using R for other purposes, for statistical analysis. And I think the reason for doing it rather than in Python for me was the fact that I think in the social sciences for every student that uses Python I can probably find another eight or nine that use R just much more widespread adoption. Right. Okay. Thank you. And a, another advantage of this is that it's entirely, so unlike some commercial products, there are two main differences. One is that everything is open source. So if there are any errors or if someone wants to know exactly how something is produced, the source code is all there. It's possible to look at that and find mistakes to, and people do all the time, um, even this morning, mm. find mistakes and suggest fixes or improvements. And the other difference is that it's basically a, an environment, it's a library for a programming language. So you can do things by calling certain commands that will produce output. Um, you don't need to know many of those commands, but you have the ability to work this into something broader to construct things that are not limited by end user software. For example, the Lexamancer program is uh, commercially produced end user software. So neither of these two things that I've said about the uh, the R uh, about R and the the package that we developed for it would apply to that.